welcome. Thank you for joining us to the Gate Equity webinar. This webinar is available online, so you can grab that PowerPoint right now. I'm Kathy Anderson, OSPI Graduation Equity Program Supervisor, and today's topic is Youth Engagement 101 Engagement Strategies. We chose this topic because at the heart of learning is curiosity and interest, and students can feel immensely empowered by giving them opportunities to own and share their learning. We want to talk about youth engagement today because it has so much promise for building powerful relationships, feeding a growth mindset, and connecting students to relevant opportunities in life. Uh, this webinar is brought to you through OSPI. So uh, at OSPI, we envision all students prepared for post-secondary pathways, careers, and civic engagement and specifically from the Office of System and School Improvement. We do have an equity statement that we've developed that we think helps frame our webinars. We believe each student, family, and community possesses strengths and cultural knowledge that benefit their peers, educators, and schools. We hope that gate equity webinars help educate leaders examine their current practices and policies and the impacts that they have for student groups and that we highlight policies and practices that ensure all students have access to instruction and support. Cool new thing, OSPI has a YouTube channel and we're trying to get a thousand subscribers. So if you can subscribe, you get really cool stuff like notifications for when we post our webinar recordings or any of the videos that come out of OSPI. So if you wanna stay in the know, you should definitely check that out. This afternoon, the very talented Bonnie Zimmerman has got Chan Hellman on the line with us. And so he's going to talk a little bit more about the power of hope and what that looks like. Next month, we do have more webinars coming your way. We're going to be talking about multiple pathways. It's going to be pretty awesome. And there's also another webinar series, a sister webinar series at OSPI that has so much great information for you. They have a great lineup of presenters and topics, and this webinar would be useful for any school that wants to think more deeply about multi-tiered systems of supports implementation. It was created to support early MTSS adopters in Washington, and it provides a great place to network and learn from other schools, as well as from these nationally recognized experts in MTSS. And so we're linking to their bios here if you wanna learn more. I know I'll be there to soak up some of that knowledge and I hope that you can check it out too. It's usually the second Friday of the month, 11 to noon. For today's webinar, our hope is that you walk away with a foundational understanding of practices for youth engagement. We want you to gain an awareness of sweet spots, potential pitfalls, and what you can do to recover. And we want you to hear from an impressive group of youth who were empowered and are feeling engaged from the Green Hill School. And of course, we always get you resources so that you have something that you can use tomorrow to kickstart some of these best practices. And we have quite the panel today. A lot of people were involved in the making of this webinar. From OSPI, I'm joined by our Substance Abuse Prevention Program Supervisor, who is also working on the Health Youth Survey. That's Emily Mon. From Department of Children, Youth, and Families, we have Greg Williamson, Director of the Office of Youth Engagement and Adolescent Programs, and his intern, Michelle John. From the Healthcare Authority, we have Evelyn Clark, who is the Youth Peer Liaison Program Manager and works on child, youth, and family behavioral health. And we have the privilege to be joined in person with some of the staff from the Green Hill School. We have Jennifer Redman, the superintendent, Cindy Blue, the transition reentry program manager, and two Green Hill residents, Aaron and Nathan. Thanks everyone for taking the time to be with us and to share your perspectives. We do have Emily Mon with us today, and she is, among other projects, she works on this Healthy Youth Survey, where the students in our state offer their voices on a variety of questions. You can check out these results for our region at askhys.net. And Emily, we're gonna ask you to share these results from Healthy Youth Survey on youth engagement. Can you tell us a little bit more about the results that you think are the most relevant to youth engagement in the Healthy Youth Survey? Yeah, thanks, Kepi. I do some volunteer work in the community, and a couple months ago, I was sitting in a meeting with a group of youth and a group of adults, and the adults decided that we wanted to have a youth discussion and talk about social media. And so one of the adult leaders asked the kids if they wanted to have just a discussion led by the adults or if they wanted to do more of a question and answer from the kids. And one of the girls, who was a junior in high school, very respectively said she thought it would be more important or it'd be better to have a question and answer, and then noted 
because adults think they know what we want, but they really don't. And I think her comment is a great example of the importance of youth engagement. As adults and youth are able to work together to listen to one another, they're able to accomplish goals in a more effective manner, and which in the long run helps both of them. And including youth in the conversation is a protective factor and supports positive academic social health outcomes in youth. It can't be noted, the Healthy Youth Survey is administered throughout the state of Washington at every two years. It's given to kids in sixth through 12th grade. The only youth uh, voice survey that's given throughout the whole entire state. So this survey is anonymous and it's voluntary. We don't ever connect the answers back to the youth. And it asks a wide variety of questions to if you eat your fruits and vegetables, to if you actually to different behaviors and things like that. So on the survey, there are some questions pertaining to youth engagement. And as noted on this slide, 53% of eighth graders and 51% of 10th graders stated that they can help make class decisions. 86% of 10th graders and 87% of 12th graders said they had lots of chances to be part of class discussion or activities. And over 90% of students from all grades stated that there were opportunities at their school to participate in sports clubs and other activities outside of the classroom. And so as you can see from this slide, the kids are noting that they do have a lot of opportunities to participate and be involved which is great. Now there's other questions on the Healthy Youth Survey that we're going to look at now that are can be kind of unnerving and disturbing to look at and unsettling. There's questions that talk about depression and suicide and anxiety. And the reason that we're going to go through these topics is that as we look at kids, the youth engagement, it's important to look at the whole child is that we don't know everything that's going on in every child's life. We don't know everything that's going on in every adult life, but it's important to note that these things are going on and why, as I noted, it can be disturbing and unsettling to look at these statistics. It's important to look at them because as the youth will talk about later in this discussion is that everybody has a story. So the kids are asked the question during the past 12 months, did you ever feel so sad or hopeless almost every day for two weeks or more in a row that you stopped doing your usual activity. So as you can see here in the 2018 results um, of the state sample, 32% of eighth graders, 40% of 10th graders, and 41% of 12th graders noted that they had reported feeling sad or hopeless for at least two weeks in the last year. They noted they also talk about anxieties. In the darker green on your left is the percentage of students who noted that they were anxious or nervous or on edge in the past two weeks. And the lighter green is that they were not able to stop con or control worrying. Those numbers, over 50% for anxious and nervous and not be able to control worrying is over 45% for those three grade levels. And then kids are asked about suicidal feelings and actions. And as you look at this slide again, this isn't really happy information to look at, but it's really important to note that these are the kids' truth, thoughts, and feelings. So your lighter red on your left-hand side is the percentage of students that stated they considered attempting suicide in the past year. As you can see, that's over 20% for the three grades. The middle column there is they made a suicide plan. So 16% for eighth grade, 18% for 10th grade, and 18% for 12th grade. And the last is the attempted suicide in the past year. So 10% for both eighth and 10th grade, and then 9% for 12th grade. With those statistics, are we able to see some of the kids' thoughts and feelings about mental health? And there is another question is here is the kids are asked, are there people in school who will help them if they need it? So with all mental health, there's not a blanket answer how to help or address mental health issues. Every person's different. But as noted here, the kids did note that over 70%, so 74% of eighth graders, 70% of 10th graders, and 70% of 12th graders said that they did have somebody in the school that would help them if they needed it. There is also an option there if they're not sure if they have somebody to help them. As you can see, 19% of 8th graders, 22% of 10th graders, and 17% of 12th graders said they weren't sure if there was someone to help them. So as we go throughout the rest of this webinar, just keep these statistics in mind, and I encourage you to look, as Kefi noted, if you go to askhys.net, you can look at your county your ESD level and uh, state level data, and as well as your district level data on the Healthy Youth Survey. And with the Healthy Youth Survey, it's interesting to me that a lot of people don't realize that those questions about school protective factors and risk factors are on there. So it really is worth just checking out to see what answers are there and to cross them between the different answers. It's a really cool tool. Greg Williamson is an all around awesome guy, and he is going to teach us a little bit about youth engagement this morning. So thanks for being here, Greg. We really appreciate you. Thanks, Kefi. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with my colleagues. I'm here with Michelle John, who's an 
intern who works with me from PLU. Also sitting next to me is another colleague of mine from the Healthcare Authority, Evelyn Clark, who does a lot of stuff in the behavioral health realm that you heard, but also is one of the other few state employees who's funded just to work with young people to help set up these systems and processes around youth engagement. So I appreciate that. And then joined by fabulous colleagues from Green Hill School. I initially was trained as a high school teacher back in the mid 80s before many of you were born and have been working long career in education policy and education administration, the policy stuff at the legislature and the congressional staff in Washington, D.C. And then I've been in educational administration largely at OSPI and the Department of Early Learning. And then two times in my life, I've been really fortunate to have meaningful youth engagement be part of my work, and that's one time for two years at OSPI when we had an Office of Student Engagement, and now at uh, DCYF uh, in the Adolescent Programs Division where we have an Office of Youth Engagement. What we're really talking about is, you know, learning what young people need and what you need to support them, and that's kind of the focus that we're doing, so I appreciate being interacting with you all today so you can give us more ideas and uh, suggestions about how young people can do more authentic and meaningful work and in school and in life, and we think that that will have an effect back on some of those anxiety and depression things we talked about before. Back in 1988, when I was working with some other colleagues talking about this kind of stuff, people looked at us like we had snakes coming out of our mouth. What are you talking about? Sharing power with children. That just doesn't sound like a thing we want to do. But today, I can happily say that at the international level, the national level, state policy, working with young people is part of policy. It's part of what we do. Greta Thunberg is Time's Person of the Year this year, who's been doing the work around climate. There's a lot of stuff happening at the international level, at the national level. HHS and Department of Education have things for us to make sure that we're doing, including people. And then at SPI, you saw in the equity policy that, that Kefi put up, that equity policy is a thing that, Scott, we need to listen to and work with young people in decisions right now. Why do we do this work? It's the right thing to do. And why do we do this work? Because I'm a systems thinker. That's where my training is. And this stuff just works. You need to get the whole system in the room. You want to have people, people do support what they help create. And so for any of you in the school improvement realm, we'll have some tidbits for you about how young people participated in school improvement. Why doesn't young youth voice and action happen more often and more easily? Yes, of course, there's adultism out there, and we really want to help people change their perspective, but there are also systemic barriers that we can change to make this stuff easier. Today, you're going to get concepts, history, and one really cool example. We have a definition for you from the Rennie Center, which is Center for Educational Research and Policy, defining student voice as youth participation and decision-making in the structures and practices that shape their educational experiences. What's present in that definition for you? What's missing for you? For me, a lot of times, weird coming from me, but I do not believe in youth voice. I don't believe in student voice without corresponding action from adults. If we just listen to young people and then we never do anything in response, it's kind of empty and hollow. And so this definition has student voice in it, but it's also got all those other things about participation and decision making that we like. Bill Grace was a guy from the Center for Ethical Leadership, and he was asked, you know, why this is crazy idea of sharing decisions with 15 year olds and 13 year olds and eight year olds, sharing power. He said, do you think they don't have power now? I think students don't have the power to shut down this school right now if they wanted. So working with young people, we're really trying to equalize some of those power dynamics. We've got research summary that shows that empowering youth voice helps young people with goals, planning, and leading to tasks. This afternoon, you'll hear from Dr. Chan Hellman about hope research, which is that hope is a goal plus a plan plus some drive to be able to reach a goal. And that's really what he measures in the hope process. We see here on this page also that we've got increased feelings of belonging and purpose, and that this especially works with high risk students investments in schooling, which is a lot of what we do at DCYF. You may have heard of Hart's ladder of youth participation, but basically you've got non-participation at the bottom of the ladder, manipulation, decoration, tokenism. As you go up the ladder, youth get more involved. And then at the very top of the ladder, you've got youth adult equity, each bringing their strengths and necessary support to the other. How are the adults helping young people be successful, driving from the young people's ideas? The equity is about fairness and eliminating barriers, and that's built into this and the OSPI definition that we saw earlier. Are we working in schools on young people working on the theme for the dance? or youth design training for adults, like you'll hear about later from the young people at Green Hill. There's a story behind each of these items. Please contact me if you'd like to know more. This is about partnerships and systems. 
student to student, we had 125 high schools where there were student taught lessons about the new graduation requirements back in 2004. That would not have happened without Susan Fortin and AWSP, the school principals and the student leaders across the state. We had a student engagement office that we got some federal funding for, and we would not have been able to be successful in teaching these kinds of strategies to 1,500 adults with three high schools doing it if we didn't have some professional development systems to tap into. We had the thing called an engaged, enraged rubric made by some students. They'll show you a couple slides hence. We had for the school improvement folks, Renton's McKnight Middle School had three groups of students work with the middle schoolers to create a climate and culture rubric for the school improvement plan. That's us using the school improvement process to infuse student-driven work right into it, and the work at the middle school was benefiting from that. There was a legislative youth council that was invented during the same time by an 11-year-old. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. And we had this readiness to learn program where it was a wraparound mental health program across the state. There were 55 different programs. We allowed them to spend money on youth engagement, and when it seemed like they didn't really know how to do that, we got some of the students from their program had them make a short magazine about what do we know as students, what is this program, how can we make the program better, and what's the benefit of adults working with us differently. They had a little book signing, it's the kind of thing you can do, and the young people then taught this to the 55 adults who did one for themselves, and then went back to their 55 programs and did the same process with their young people. So it's young people driving change at programs. The next slide is a, a mental model that was come up with students by, uh, during these years in this project at OSBI about youth who are involved in their learning, care more about education, and do better in school and life. And so it's a mental model that just helped them look at how do we produce outcomes for students, but also how do we improve better system outcomes and have more respectful processes. The next one is the engaged, enraged rubric. Ann Hawkins and her seventh and eighth graders at Jason Lee Middle School came up with this on their own. And then what we did at the student engagement office was get them to the legislature, teachers, college teacher prep programs, and other places to talk about not let's whine and complain about the teachers in our school, but let's instead look at what's the standard across the top of this, it's beginning, approaching, meeting, and exceeding. What does meeting the standard look like for my attitude toward my job or for exceeding the standard? And so we now are working with this same type of a rubric, not just to talk about teacher dispositions, but also other adults and also the students themselves. When you hear the students uh, talk here in a few minutes, you're gonna see that they really meet standard in many of the areas of the things we want. And so these tools that young people develop are a way that we can get from complaint about something to dialogue about the standard. What happens when we ask students to examine the standards for their own behavior? The next slide is about the Legislative Youth Council. Please Google it. They are looking for members, adult volunteers. It was the idea of an 11-year-old that uh, went to the legislature and got this passed. And then the last slide I've got for you here is really about the DCYF Office of Youth Engagement that we're doing right now. So again, we had one of these for a while at OSPI and built on that same model. We're doing the same kind of thing at Children, Youth, and Families. We have a two-part mission. One is to improve our programs by working with young people directly. The second thing is we believe we can add accelerant by working with young people to the process that our agency is supposed to do around education, health, and resilience. We think that students can get farther faster if they're involved in the design and delivery of their own programs. We have five main groups of young people we work with, child welfare, young people impacted by child welfare, juvenile rehabilitation, like the young man you're gonna meet today, teen parents, Office of Homeless Youth folks who work with the Office of Homeless Youth, youth and also people in the regular K-12 environment who might be working on prevention or they might just want to do youth engagement strategies in their school. They can call us up. They can ask us questions about that. And we work very closely with our colleagues at OSPI who have a lot of expertise on this too. And we want to connect to you all in the field who have expertise so that we can make referrals to you as well. We have five roles that we're seeing inside DCYF right now. Some of the young men here are doing more than one of these. Individual involvement in their own planning and transition out of our programs, mentoring other young people, teaching adults like they're gonna be doing today, being on advisory groups like the Youth Voice Group that these two young men are members of, changing policy like they got to do with the state legislature where they passed this JR to 25 legislation you'll hear more about. We have a four-part work plan for our work where we're trying to build shared understanding about youth engagement strategies. 
to figure out how to measure what I will politely call give a crapness. How do you measure whether or not a young person actually cares about something? We're trying to look at projects like the one you're going to hear about from Green Hill today that come from young people that are designed by young people. And then we're trying to build a learning community. And the good news is we had 11 state agencies, 21 people come together over the last month to, for our first meeting to talk about how does the Department of Health or Ecology or other people do this. And so we're spreading the word. We use a four-part listening protocol you'll hear about from Michelle where we listen, reflect, respond, and engage with young people. And we've got a long list of things that would make this work easy and effective and happen more often across schools and other places. How do we deal with the risk management, the legal requirements, safety? Do we have basic principles of youth engagement like do no harm? How do we equitize engagement around transportation, snacks, paying stipends to youth? How do we offer training to youth and adults? If there are evidence-based practices, how do we share them? What's our research agenda? What's our evaluation protocol? What kind of outcomes are we getting? What kind of communication strategies do we have? Jennifer is here today. She and I have these conversations all the time about, we would love to have this stuff happen more often, but sometimes it's staffing or money or transfer. There's a lot of barriers. How do we get rid of them? So that's part of what my job is with Michelle. And my question for you is, what would it look like if the state, the educational service district, your school district, your building had more tools to support adults to more meaningfully engage young people in the process and content of their learning and programs? So DCYF and many other systems work similarly in that youth are first exposed to and experience trauma. From here, they are identified as needing services and resources, often through engagement with child welfare, juvenile rehabilitation, and the foster care system. Youth progress through and exit our programs, but too often they find themselves back in the system and the cycle repeats. Some, however, have the tools and escape velocity to, it, to exit and be successful. We believe that through listening and responding to the young people, through closing these voice action loops, outcomes in youth well-being is improved. Meaningful youth engagement at DCYF happens through a four-part listening protocol. First, space must be opened up for adults to listen to young people, take notes and ask questions. Next, it's important to reflect this listening, show these notes, and make sure that everybody has the same idea and is on the same page. For respond, the big question is, what are we going to do about it? What can we do? What's next? What can't we do? How can we make those no's turns into yeses? And at the core of engage, we acknowledge that youth are the experts on youth, genuinely. If we do this listening protocol over and over again, we build trust. From trust, we improve outcomes, programs, and the success of youth engagement itself. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Redman, and I'm the superintendent at Green Hill School, which is a juvenile facility in Chehalis, Washington. We have two parts to our campus. We have a, an on-campus high school through the Chehalis School District, as well as a residential treatment component on the other side. Before we begin, I just want to introduce the amazing people I get to be here with today. Uh, first is Aaron and Nathan, and they are our two youth presenters. They'll be speaking here in just a moment. Cindy Blue, who I'll highlight in a moment as well, and Evelyn Clark, who she is through the Healthcare Authority, and she's here to talk a little bit about some examples of partnership with the Healthcare Authority and her role as the youth liaison. I'm Evelyn Clark. I have a really cool job. I'm very fortunate to be in this position. I was actually hired for my lived experience in the juvenile justice and behavioral health system as a young person some years ago now. We were able to get funding last year to train. I, I run a program at Healthcare Authorities called Youth Professional Leadership Training. It's a training designed to help professionals work with young people and to really help instill leadership into them. The Healthcare Authority, we got some funding. We were really excited, so we decided to revamp the materials and we partnered with Green Hill School, and so we were able to go in there and train up 25, I believe, young leaders there at Green Hill School on the youth leadership training. And from there is they were able to get the idea of, hey, like we were trained in this really cool training. We want our staff to be able to understand this as well. We want to be able to build rapport with them, to build that partnership with our staff, which is incredible. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of context around that. I would say that's also key to engaging youth is to have somebody who has been in similar situations and hardships and be able to say, hey, like, you can do this. And I tell the young people all the time that the movement youth engagement is that they take our positions 
So just being really mindful that we need to kind of start thinking about what we as adults want to continue to do for the young people, but have them move up into our positions because that's, that's the movement. So I will let them talk because they have all of the context and they are really the leaders of this work. So over the years, not only Green Hill School, but the juvenile rehabilitation as a whole and even national organizations have learned that to better serve youth, adults need to engage them and listen more. At Green Hill School, we have been a part of numerous forums, both internal and external to Green Hill School. Green Hill School has built a foundation of youth voice in their operations and it continues to grow. Not only is it important to have a facility or organization that supports this philosophy, but it's also important to have a leader champion it, and our leader is Cindy Blue. She creates an environment that fosters open sharing, models how to give and receive feedback, and consider the big picture first before ourselves as individuals. So Aaron and Nathan are gonna provide examples of all the great work that they have been 100% instrumental in at Green Hill School. All right, yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is Aaron Tolefoa. I'm a member of this Youth Voice Committee at Green Hill School. To kind of give some history on this, so Green Hill started a local Youth Voice about six years ago, and the council consists of about 20 youth, sometimes it varies. It began with youth leadership developing proposals to change or improve their living conditions. For example, some youth wanted to improve <clears throat> their living conditions by having healthier food items that they're able to purchase. And so a presentation was made to explain why and what they could do to make things better. So as this council developed in itself, those youth began to work on bigger things like policy locally and also JR policy, public speaking events, and really an outstanding thing is the juvenile justice advocacy work. So on the slide, you can see some of the things. So recently we've learned about research that's been done around the science of the adolescent brain and how it impacts interactions and behavior. And learning this, the youth voice really pushed for legislation that took into account the brain science when youth are sentenced. Quick spill for these bills. Senate Bill 6160 was passed in 2018. This bill allows for certain offenses that would have otherwise resulted in adult sentences to instead remain in juvenile court, but be given exceptional sentences up to age 25. House Bill 1646 that was passed in 2019 allows for youth serving adult sentences to remain in the JR facility up to the age 25. And those youth with sentences concluding prior to age 25 are able to access other parts of the JR continuum. Thank you, Aaron. This is Nathan Brooks. I'm also part of the youth voice that we have over at Green Hill. We've been working recently to not only work with legislation, but we've also been working on some stuff for the local, I mean, just the, the facility itself. And one of the things we've been working on is this proposal for a four-part training for adults. And this training would be taught by the residents who helped to write the program. So. The reason that we found that this would probably be important is because of the population change to 25, it's important that staff at our uh, facility be able to understand not only where people are coming from, but what they've been through and, and learning to communicate. And as you can see, we, we broke the training into four parts. It is to be approximately one and a half to two hours long. As of now, we've been piloting it with a couple of small groups, testing it out here and there, and, and kind of just getting feedback. The, the whole point of this training is to be, I mean, it was written, it's going to be taught, and facilitated by youth the entire time. Part one, it's, it's the student story. So the, the whole point of this beginning part is like an introduction. We're gonna be sharing some of our personal stories, our background, kind of letting these guys know where we're, where we're from, who we are as people, you know, our stories, not just our JRA numbers and in, in, in what we're here for. It's very important that people know who we are as people and, and our background and, and to be able to not only share our experiences, but also hear from the staff to share some of their experiences and see what we have in common and, and show that it's very important to know that everyone has experienced some form of trauma. I and mean, I think that's something that we can all connect on. So then at the, after we tell the beginning of our story, we'll meet at the tables and you know, that's when we'll hear from the childhood trauma from the adults. Um, and then afterwards, we'll debrief and look for connections to show that everyone has experienced some form of trauma, like I stated earlier. For part two, we'll be going over trauma-informed care We'll be showing a video on TED Talk to speak of the effects of traumatic experiences. This can be anything from physical effects all the way to mental effects. Trauma has a long list of effects that can last for your entire life. There can be positive effects and negative effects. A lot of people don't know that. Then next we'll be reading about the ACEs and showing resiliency. We'll be reading this and then asking them to fill it out. A lot of people don't know that they've experienced trauma. So the ACEs form will be able to show them that they've been through trauma and to, to help them recognize their own level of traumatic experience. After that, we'll be showing a uh, trauma-informed demonstration. This will be done while blowing up a balloon. 
and we'll be telling about how the pressure has shown up in that young man's life. The, the young man will be basically telling the story while blowing up the balloon. And, and it just shows that as pressure builds and builds and builds, eventually the balloon will pop. And that, that will show that, you know, everyone has their limits. After that, we'll be participating in reviewing a handout about trauma-informed care and, and how best to deal with that. And that was written by Dr. Isaiah Pick. So in this part of the training, we talk about communication. There's some role play that reenacts staff and resident interactions. That's for people to analyze and get feedback on. And the reason for this segment is to stress the importance of positive and constructive communication. So in the end, we'll benefit everyone by creating that safe, comfortable, open, and effective environment. A lot of times, youth and adults are pinned against each other. It's a lot of negative tension in the air. But what we want to show in this part of the training is that through communication, through clear communication, we're able to eliminate the possibilities of people not understanding each other, not knowing what or where someone is coming from when they speak. And so that's really the reason for this slide, this part in the training is just to get clear communication with each other, both youth and adult. Part four will be changing assumptions. We'll be ending the training with that because I think this is one of our most important parts. The world today is completely plagued by titles and labels and assumptions that people make about other people. And I think it can really affect just communication completely. I mean, if someone makes an assumption about someone, it can alter the way they react or associate themselves with other people. And this is especially common in, in your institution situations. You know, you have your assumptions about people that are incarcerated and why they're there and and who they may be as people when sometimes that's not true at all. So we'll be guiding the participants to list common assumptions that staff make before they start the job, you know, like what they've seen while they're out, what they hear from people. We'll be writing these down on a piece of paper. And then we'll also be going over some of the assumptions that maybe residents have towards staff. Some of the things that we think, and that's in the second part when we'll reveal our own assumptions and realities. We'll show realities that maybe assumptions aren't always true. There's a lot of realities. And, and some, you know, some people may assume that incarcerated youth may be aggressive and the reality to that is, you know, not all of us are aggressive. A lot of us have made mistakes and want to progress and learn. And then showing that reality can show people that there's progress that can be made. And then not only that, we'll be asking the staff to offer their own realities in response to their assumptions. And this will give us a chance to hear from the staff and, and get some of the realities from them and, and learn the truth so we can eliminate our assumptions and help share that with our other peers. At the end of that, we'll be asking the staff to fill out a handout that we'll give them. We'll ask them to write down one assumption in reality that they can relate to. And then if they're willing to and they feel like sharing, we'll ask them to share with their group. And then we can kind of go over that and discuss, uh, you know, why they relate to that and, and how it's affected their life and the possibility of eliminating that. Why do we think it is important for staff to hear from us directly? So for the purpose of this presentation, we thought it would be important to connect our work at Green Hill to your work as educators in school settings. We all went to school and most of us at Green Hill had struggled. But one thing that was commonly shared was that there weren't many times youth were asked for feedback that would make school more comfortable and a place that would be more successful for the individual. Our hope is that this project we're doing at Green Hill, specifically the training for staff, would help you consider something similar in your setting. Acknowledging that while staff and teachers are professionals in their field of work, students are also the professionals in their lives and experiences. And knowing that, we're able to create a better outcome for everyone. So here's what we think is possible if staff and residents work together more effectively. Uh, a positive environment, a feel of safety and confidentiality, and the removal of the labels and titles that are assumed. We were asked if there was three things we wanted school staff to know about us. And the, the three huge parts that came to everyone's mind right away was that we want teachers to know that we as students want to learn. Some people come in and, and may not show that, but a lot of us just have difficulties learning. But that doesn't mean that we don't want to learn. We're here to learn and want to progress. We also wanted teachers to know that everyone learns differently. There's a lot of people that learn in many different ways. And that doesn't mean that someone may not learn as quickly as another. It just means that we all learn differently. And I think that the next most important part was that teachers, we need teachers who are passionate. We don't want teachers. We need teachers who are passionate about our education. We need teachers that are going to come to work and be passionate about making sure that we succeed. I mean, we are the, we are the future and we need teachers who are that see us that way and are willing to help us out. Three things that we think the schools do well. At Green Hill School, we've had the opportunities to get individual support in our schoolwork. Because the classrooms are smaller, we've had more one-on-one -on -one time, and, and that has definitely helped people, especially people with, that are slower in progress or people that are quicker in progress. It's always at your own pace, and it's given people a chance to really succeed. Also at Green Hill School, there's not the constant overload of excessive schoolwork. Everything's at your own pace. It gives people a chance that are quicker to move quicker. It gives people a chance that maybe aren't as quick a chance to really slow down and make sure that they're doing things correctly and learning what they need to learn.
we have very positive interactions with our teachers. We have a lot of teachers that are very passionate about us. I think that's why we have such a high success rate with our graduation levels is because we have so many teachers that are willing to be very positive and work with us to succeed. However, as great as schools are, there are always things that we can improve on. Some of the things that we think we can improve on is some vocational classes. For example, at Green Hill School, we have welding. We can get welding certificates. We have an automotive class that helps people go into the automotive field as well as in a new program that teaches construction. A lot of people don't realize how important these vocational classes are in helping people exceed straight into the job force. And along with that is teaching your life skills, your financial literacy, your adulting skills. A lot of people don't think of adulting as adulting, but when you move on, you need skills to, to be able to, to function. You know, when you move out of the house, you need these skills to be able to pay bills and interview and ask some kids out of high school if they even know how to do an interview what to wear, what to be, you know, what they're going to be asked. Just programs such as that. And then running start, you know, giving someone a head start in college is important. And then smaller class sizes. I remember going to school and my class size, you know, we had 40, 50 people in it. And that was just so much, it was overburdening the teachers. And it was just really limiting the ability for the one-on-one -on -one time and, and helping people succeed. I just want to highlight them once again. So these are two high school graduates. And so they've already graduated and both are taking college courses. And that's because of their perseverance and just drive, as well as the amazing academic program with our, our teachers at Green Hill School who are willing to, to work and match to their learning style, which Nathan highlighted. The questions are open, so we're, we're willing to take questions and see what we can answer. We do have one from the Q&A, and we're wondering, how can a teacher get involved in to be, a, to be a teacher at Green Hill School, it would be through the Shahela School District because that's who we have an agreement with to provide educational resources. We are currently in communication with Centralia Community College to do some expansion for post-secondary education on our campus because our population is, is going up to age 25 now. In regards to Green Hill School on the residential treatment side, which works hand in hand a lot with the academic side, careers.wa.gov, <laughs> just filter out Green Hill School. We're always looking for passionate people who care about kids. Uh, does the school have any involvement with online classes? Yeah, some. Unfortunately, well, I don't know if it's unfortunate, but it's, it's correspondence. We have some network issues that we're working through in regards to us being a, a juvenile justice facility, but those issues hopefully will be resolved within the next year, especially with our expanding population and needing to be more connected with colleges. Not the traditional online environment, but we're doing a lot of workarounds right now, and hopefully in a year we'll be streamlined. Do you have any advice for people who are about to enter the prison system? If I could give advice, I would just say that just because that you're going to enter that system doesn't mean that you should put your head down and, and just try to get through it. There are so many opportunities. I think a lot of people don't realize the amount of opportunities. I mean, if you really open up and you seek out help and advice, there's a lot you can learn. I remember entering the system as just a 13-year-old kid and I didn't really know anything. And for a while, I didn't want to learn anything. And then I've, I've learned to open up and ask for help. And I can't say how much help I've gotten from the people at Green Hill and how much, how much they've helped me and learn who I am and, and how to better myself and, and being offered the vocational classes and the, and the skills trainings that we've gone through is just so much stuff that's been able to help me progress myself towards a, a successful member of the community. So it's just if I could say one thing, it's just to be that don't give up and further yourself. What did your teachers do to reach you? It's often hard to break through. I would say for me, there was a couple of teachers at Green Hill that really went sort of against the norm, I would say, hmm. of uh, teaching really and was creative about their way of teaching. So I know my science teacher coming to a facility or an institution, wherever it may be, you're going to think that, okay, so everything's going to be just on a computer. You're not really going to have much interaction with the teacher other than you know whatever questions you have but for this certain teacher he was able to really go outside of the box get everyone involved at the same time so even though that people in the class were on different levels of education we were all able to you know work on different subjects uh, different things that we were able to you know have fun over so that's one thing and do you guys have any advice on how to motivate students in the community to follow through when life gets in the way? My advice, and this would probably go for the other question on what would you say to people that are coming into the system, uh, both of that, what I would say is that one, one uh, phrase that I kind of live by is 
to whom much is given, much is expected. So whatever you're going through in life, even though you may have a lot on your plate, it's like what Nathan said, don't just, you know, put your head down and try to get through it. Know that a lot of work is going to be needed to get through whatever you're going through. And that's what I would say. How's instruction provided? Do you have a live classes? Is it online? What other leadership opportunities can students take advantage of? What does it look like? It's traditional classrooms. We have a, a vocational classroom building with some of the options that Nathan described. We do have some computer work, but they're all teacher-led. So it's it's just like a, a, a relatively normal high school. They change classes, go to a science class, a math class, so on and so forth. We try to mirror as much as what community or public school would look like as possible. Leadership engagement activities? Yeah, activities. Mm -hmm. How else do they get involved? So they, they spoke about the local youth voice, and so that's our, our youth leadership committee that informs policy and practices both within Green Hill as well as outside of Green Hill. They inform DCYF policies, so things that I would equate that to out in the, the public schools would be obviously your policies or standards, your, your student handbook, I guess, is what they would be informing as well as district policy and things like that, which I know there's been some engagement around that, around dress codes and things like that in public schools. They've done the legislative work. They work with a lobbyist where they inform bills that are of their interest that touch the juvenile justice population predominantly. So they work directly with legislators and write letters. They've testified in various legislative sessions. Aaron participates in a, a national committee where he's doing WebEx's it seems like daily, but I'm, I'm sure it's not quite that frequent. They, they're informing kind of juvenile justice work beyond Washington State. So I think as far as what do we do, we just open the doors. We just sit back and let them be available to the extent that our resources can allow, which Greg touched on. It's hard at times because it takes staffing and, and coordination. But I think what we don't do is put up barriers. Thanks so much. We are going to go on to this part, and our friends at Green Hill asked specifically for some feedback from you guys. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. This is our first webinar. We haven't had the opportunity to do something like this before, and we're very excited to be able to have such a wonderful opportunity. And we are very, very happy to provide feedback for everyone. We appreciate your time, and I just want to say thank you. Greg, I think I'm going to have you come over and talk a little bit about some resources. You did create a cool document for us that's posted on the Gate Equity webinar page that has some resources for student engagement. And do you want to just talk through some of these other stuff? Yeah. Thanks very much, Kefi. When at OSPI we had the Office of Youth Engagement or Student Engagement, we created a, just a resource sheet that you've now got an updated version of today. And I always put something like, this this is draft. Please tell me what you don't like. Please give me suggestions for things you do like. If there's a program you hear about, it's a really evergreen kind of a list that we want updates to. So please use it. Also send me questions. On each of the areas, there are tons of definitions. There are many research articles. The national and international researchers on this, many of whom are meeting right now today in Australia, say that this field of meaningful youth engagement really is a nascent field and the measurements and the evidence-based practices are not really where we want them to be yet. And so this is an exciting thing for you as educators and researchers to participate in designing this movement. The TVW documentary, More Than Their Crimes, as you know, the young men that are in Green Hill have committed crimes, many serious crimes. They are doing their work to make restitution in the processes that they do. They also changed laws last year. So this documentary is about them. You'll love it. If you enjoyed today's session, you should click on that and really you'll enjoy it. There's another thing called Engaged, which is a whole series of shows that TVW did about all different kinds of things. And one of the things you'll notice is for every adult voice, you'll hear about six young people voices. So it's a good thing you can use in your classrooms and your school board meetings to really model what are we talking about here. There's a bunch of stuff on ACEs on the CDC. ACEs is part of the training that the young men are doing at Green Hill. Hearts Ladder, as I mentioned, Andrea Wessel and I will be doing a whole session on that tomorrow at the WIRA conference. But anybody who wants more information about that, go back to Roger Hart's original document, which is on the uh, resources for student engagement, and then ask us questions if you have them. And there's just a whole bunch of things that we would love to connect you with, including the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, 
So a lot of stuff happening around ACEs and resiliency. Such cool resources out there for us. And of course, if you do want personalized assistance, we want to connect you to the right people. So you can always use this link to get support from our building at OSPI. And Kathy, on that one thing, I'll mm -hmm. just say that I, I mentioned this earlier, but we're available at the Office of Youth Engagement at DCYF to other state agencies and to you in education land. So just, uh, I, we're, we'd be happy to get those calls so that they're not all going, uh, you know, uh, to, we're, let's share the work. <laughs> Absolutely. And anything you need help with, if you have questions, we like to answer them and get you connected to the stuff that you need. All of this work is from the Creative Commons or it came from the Noun Project. Thanks everybody. And thank you to our presenters. Awesome.